Well, thank you. Well, it's um, so great to be here. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining my talk today. And thank you, Nico, for inviting me to share my work again um, as part of the Phaedra Summer series. Um, it's super exciting to be able to share the progress of this project and, in fact, the, the, the final results of this project, um, which I've been working on now for, for about three years now. Um, so I'll be talking today about my collaborative print edition with Island Press, and which focuses on the drawn notations that were made by the Harvard computers. So my talk's about 40 minutes, and I'm hoping uh, we'll have some time for discussion afterwards. Um, I've divided the talk into three parts. So first, I will be discussing the plates I worked with, um, and then I will introduce you to Island Press. And then I'll share with you the essay that I wrote for the print edition folio, um, while also sharing images of the final artworks and some of the documentary photography taken at my time at the press. Um, but first, I thought I would just take a minute to introduce you to my work um, in case uh, you're not familiar with it. And, um, and so I'll share a few images from various projects and just kind of give some general context about my practice. So I am a research-based artist and I work across disciplines and focus on the many intersections between art, science, nature, and culture. I am curious about the places where our phenomenological world meets uh, the human experience of wonder and meaning. Um, since 2011, I have focused on the material composition and origins of the cosmos as both literal and symbolic link to our connection to it. And my work as a whole is interested in cultivating an embodied relationship with the cosmos. I hold degrees in both photography and cultural heritage conservation science, which becomes important in terms of how I began to think about uh, my project with the Harvard computer notations. And um, my work leans towards archivistic and scientific methodologies, where I tend to source uh, artistic meaning from the materials and subjects themselves. So I began my path as a photographer nearly 35 years ago in high school and with an immediate love of working in early photographic processes and in particular with dry glass plate negatives like the ones that comprise the astronomical photographic plate collection. So I grew up around the Boston area and eventually actually my parents moved into Cambridge just two blocks from the Harvard Observatory Hill. So on my walks, I would see the white telescope domes and imagine what the view of a sky might have looked like in much darker nights in the late 1800s. Um, so it is perhaps no surprise then that I became, when I became aware of the Harvard's uh, astronomical plate collection and the legacy of the Harvard computers, I was just captivated. Uh, the plates contain so much of what inspires me, the rich scientific data, the cultural stories, illustrating human exploration and knowledge seeking, our longing to learn the stars, the significant people and the science that arose in the wake of, of this incredible uh, collection and their continued import in uh, contemporary research. So the astronomical photographic uh, glass plate collection is now housed within the Walbach Library, which contains both the Harvard College Observatory and the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory collections, forming one of the world's preeminent astronomical libraries. Uh, Walbach Library is also now the home to the DASH project and also the Phaedra project, as you uh, heard earlier. Um, but the Phaedra project is an initiative by the Walbach li Library um, in collaboration with partners to catalog, uh, digitize, transcribe, and enrich the metadata of 2,500 logbooks and notebooks produced by Harvard's women computers and other early astronomers. The DASH project was initiated to support the study of the sky on a hundred year time scale. So essentially to do this, DASH team is working to digitize the majority of the 500 and 550,000 glass plates in Harvard's collection to produce full photometry results of the entire sky. So I worked extensively with the glass plate collection 
through Dash, Dash's digital database and the Phaedra Notebook collection. And I'm so very grateful to both Nico Carver, who is the librarian for the collaborative programs at Walbach Library, who you met earlier, and, um, and who, by the way, is also an incredible astro photographer. Go check out his work. And, um, and also Lindsay Smith Zerall, who was the former curator of astronomical photographs. And both of, both of these humans um, were extremely generous in their time and expertise throughout my research. So I'm extremely grateful. Um, so for my print edition with Island Press, I began searching the Dash online database for plates that had been erased of the notations um, and then scanned. Um, there's no real simple way to, to do this um, or search function that allows you to do this. So I had to search the plates basically one by one. Um, and I did not search all <laughs> the collection, obviously. But, um, but so I would look through the digitized photo, uh, uh, Phaedra notebooks for pages that were tagged as showing plate numbers. And then I would enter each plate number into the dash plate search to look to see if it had markings. Um, and most of them didn't, so I would have to keep searching until I found, found ones that did. Sometimes I would arrive at a plate that had interesting markings and also had notes on the plate's envelope jacket indicating that there, were, there was a star sequence marked additionally on another plate. And so then I would search out for that plate as well. Um, if I found an interesting drawing on one plate, one thing I noticed was that if I search sort of like the hundred before and hundred after it, I would often find similar markings um, on plates within a couple of hundred plate uh, kind of section. Um, and so, so that was an effective way to find plates. But in all, I estimate I searched you know, several thousand plates and I found literally hundreds of plates with beautiful markings. So because Island Press is a small press and is dedi that's dedicated to making small editions that focus on pushing the boundaries of printmaking and creating really unique editions, I needed to narrow my working set down to six plates for the edition. So I decided to let the markings guide me um, in choosing a selection that allowed that really showed a diversity of the drawn language and the unique visual ways uh, the women had of looking at the stars. Um, so, whoops, I wanna go back to that plate for one second. There we go. Um, so this plate um, is I-6914. It is of the an area in the sky known as the Small Magellanic Cloud um, and was, uh, exposed was taken in uh, 1892. So this is the oldest plate that I worked with. Um, there, it is uncertain as to which women or the names of the women who um, may have marked this plate, but it's interesting to notice um, that this plate was uh, notated in Henrietta Swan Leavitt's uh, study of variables in one of her, in her 1903 notebook. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's understood that, that based on the markings um, uh, that this was possibly used in the study of proper motion. Um, so this is B20645, um, also of the small Magellanic cloud and was photographed in 1897. Um, this plate has an interesting story. Um, it's marked by Henrietta Swan Leavitt and possibly um, some of her assistants. Um, the plate was used in Levitt's 1908 groundbreaking paper titled uh, 1777 Variables in the Magellanic Clouds, which compared variable stars and basically eventually led her uh, to her far reaching discovery of the period luminosity relationship. And I found this, this particular plate noted in her uh, 1905 notebook at least 15 times. Um, and um, so that was that was really exciting. Um, what's really wonderful is that actually this plate is has now been added to what's known as the Wilhelmina Fleming collection. Um, and although the plate um, the plate's markings had been wiped off in prior to 2016, um, the plate has such significance that it was that it was added. Um, to, to the collection, 
collection. And so the Wilhelmina Fleming collection uh, preserves um, glass plates of the women. Um, there are about 600 plates in the collection that will preserve the notations uh, for posterity. Um, and so this is actually um, the 1905 notebook, uh, Levitt's notebook that shows, um, you can see in the upper right, uh, the mention of, of the plate that I just showed you. Um, so uh, plate I20197, which is variable stars of Taurus. And you can see the Pleiades um, in the bottom uh, right-hand corner of the, the plate. Um, Again, this is, these are the negatives. So you're looking at the stars, the bright stars are black instead of positive. So uh, just a reminder there about that. But this plate was marked um, by Wilhelmina Patton Fleming um, and appears in Fleming's uh, 1905 notebook. And, um, and it was used in her identifying a variable star in the region of Algol. And then uh, plate A3657, um, that dark bright uh, sphere in the middle of that plate is Jupiter, uh, the planet Jupiter. And so I just, I love this plate. Um, the markings are also just stunning to me. They look like little birds. Those are all tiny little Vs, which is probably hard for you to see on the screen, but um, it's quite lovely. Um, this, uh, this plate was marked uh, by Sylvia Mussels um, and possibly uh, Henrietta Swan Levitt and potentially three to four other unidentified women. Um, the various ink types suggest that the markings span the turn of the century all the way to 1930. Um, and it was used to confirm the discovery of Jupiter's eighth moon. Um, and then later it was used um, to identify 22 new galaxies. And then plate AM1079, which is a variable star in Pegasus and Markov. Um, and this one is most likely, most likely was, um, marked by Henrietta Swan Levitt, although it's uncertain, could have been one of her assistants, but she does mention this um, in her 1904 to 1910 uh, notebook in a notebook called Miscellaneous Observations. Um, this is, I think, one of my favorite forms, um, and you'll see in the final artwork of it, how it plays with the gold. Um, anyway, you'll see, okay. Um, plate number A12855, um, which was the latest plate that I worked with. It was uh, exposed in 1923. And uh, this is an image of the large Magellanic cloud. Um, there are no indications of which women may have marked it, but um, it's very clear that multiple women have marked it and over time. Um, and it's suspected that the markings on this plate are consistent with galaxy and, and globular cluster count work, which was um, a priority of their work during the 1930s and 1940s. Okay. So I wanted to take a minute to introduce you to Island Press without whom I would not have been able to realize the Tracing Luminaries print edition. Uh, Island Press was founded in 1978 and is a research-based printmaking workshop at the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, Island Press creates and publishes innovative print and multiples while also educating students and the broader community about print media and advancing the printmaking field. So in the context of intensive visiting artist residencies, Island Press explores the expansive theoretical and material terrain of the print. Uh, the print. The press is project driven, tapping into the place where artist creative activity intersects with the philosophical underpinnings of printmaking. Um, 
And you can see why in a minute, they're the perfect collaborator for me on this project. Um, experimentation with new modes and technologies is a natural part of this pursuit, resulting in the creation of innovative and ambitious creations as a wide, in a wide range of media. So all good things begin with rainbows and lead flares. Uh, this is a photo of Bigsby Hall, where Island Press is located. And it was a huge honor to be invited to be uh, to by Island Press to be their spring 2021 Arthur and Sheila Prensky visiting artist and to collaborate with them to produce a new print edition. And it has been an incredible experience to work with Lisa and Tom, both pictured here on one of our weekly Zooms. Uh, Lisa uh, Bolowski is the director of Island Press and is also a professor of art and the chair of the MFA program in visual art. And Tom Reed is the Island Press master printer and is a senior lecturer. So the unique circumstances of the global pandemic led to my residency being remote, uh, which meant that for the full spring semester of 2021, we Zoomed twice a week uh, to work on the print edition. And then in the fall of 2021, I was able to visit the press and work with them briefly in person. Um, so Island Press's mission is to bring art, visiting artists to work in collaboration with the master printer, faculty, and students to create a reciprocal environment for education and research. Artists reap the benefit of numerous dedicated energetic student assistants to help push to new levels of complexity and originality in their projects. And at the same time, undergraduate and graduate students taking part in the development of artistic ideas gain access to in, an insight into both the technical and conceptual challenges that make each artist's project unique. Fostering the creative relationships of the printmaking workshop is central to the Island Press mission. So during my residency, I would meet with the students for two hours a week over Zoom to work collaboratively to solve the creative challenges of my project. And over the year and a half or so that I've been working with Island Press on this project, um, 17 student helpers have contributed their time, knowledge, and artistic hand. And so I could not be more grateful to Tom and Lisa and the students um, for thinking deeply with me about stars and materials and printmaking. And I certainly could not have done this work without them. So I'm gonna jump into reading the essay and sharing with you um, some, some imaginative um, lead-in images, as you will see, and then images of the artworks themselves, which should be pretty clear. Um, these are detailed images because uh, looking at the whole print on a screen is, is a bit difficult. So I really zoomed into the marks themselves. And then you'll see documentary images um, that were taken um, at the press in the fall. The stars are an eternal map of the imagination, imprinting their ancient light on the retinas of humans and creatures as far back as we can see. Our own eyes evolved in response to the light of our sun, a G-type main sequence star that is about 4.5 billion years old. Is it any wonder that we have directed our eyes and minds back to the stars with curiosity and intent to ponder our most elemental questions? At its essence, the Harvard Astronomical Photographic Glass Plate Collection is a vast compendium of the, rec of the recorded light of suns from across our universe. The collection is a veritable time capsule as survey of photographic materials from 1885 to 1992, as record of the light and position of stars, and as chronicled evidence of the rigorous observations made by women astronomers who marked their research notations onto the plates. These entangled stories of suns, of photography, and of, hand, of, and of the women's handwritten marks are the literal elements comprising this print edition, both in subject and material. In the late 1800s, the Harvard College Observatory began to hire a small group of women known as the Harvard Computers. 
to study and preserve the growing collection of glass plate negatives. At a time when women struggled for basic rights and freedoms, let alone roles within the sciences, the Harvard computers would come to revolutionize the science of astronomy and astrophysics through their discovery, study, and cataloging of hundreds of thousands of stars, deep space, deep sky objects, and astronomical phenomena. Their work centered around the photographic glass plate negatives that were part of an astonishing effort by Harvard to photographically document and map the entirety of the night sky. Of the more than 550,000 glass plate negatives in the collection, untold thousands were directly annotated with research-based drawings on the glassy side of the plate by the many hands of the Harvard computers. Of the more than 100 women computers who are currently known to have worked, worked at the HCO from 1881 to the 1950s, a small number are revered for their immense contributions to astronomy and astrophysics. Two of the more well-known women are thought to have marked plates that I worked with for the Tracing Luminaries print edition. Wilhelmina Fleming, who began her career at Harvard as the observatory director's housekeeper, was one of the first women officially hired as a computer. In addition to working on spectra and dwarf stars, Fleming developed a classification of stars based on their hydrogen content. She also discovered 310 variable stars, 10 novae, and 59 nebulae, including the famous Horsehead Nebula. Henrietta Swan Leavitt was a graduate of Radcliffe College and worked primarily on cataloging the brightness of stars. Her discovery was and resulting famous paper studying 1,777 variables in the small and large Magellanic clouds led to her discovery led her to discover the phenomenally significant period luminosity relationship of certain variable stars. Now known as Levitt's Law, this breakthrough established a standard candle with which to push the boundaries of parallax and triangulation to measure the great distances across space. Her research provided astronomers a path to measure the width of the Milky Way to understand that there were galaxies beyond our own and to see that the universe as a whole is expanding. Levitt's work and has continued to have far-reaching impacts on astronomy and space activities today. Two of the plates that were involved in Levitt's famous research are included in the Tracing Luminaries print edition. Sylvia Mussels Lindsay, who is the central, central figure in that image, um, was a lesser known assistant astronomer at HCO in the 1930s. However, in 1937, she discovered the first dwarf galaxy, which is known as the Sculptor Dwarf Galaxy, although the credit for her discovery is often given to Harvard's then director, Harlow Shapley. As I write, the entire collection of glass plates continues to be scanned by the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Their project, called Digital Access to a Sky Century at Harvard, or DASH, has been digitizing the plates since 2005 to produce photometry for the entire sky for the, for the study of time domain astronomy and astrophysics. It is a significant and heroic effort that will allow researchers to track and compare variability in the brightness of stars over time. The data will be used to survey long period variable stars, which have been more difficult to study given their prolonged cycles of dimming and brightening, and to examine variability that could yield new knowledge about quasars, novae, black holes, neutron stars, and perhaps even allow for the discovery of novel types of stars and phenomena. The contributions made by the women computers have continued to inform contemporary astronomy and astrophysics and will continue to do so. Thus, when I discovered that in order to achieve clean scans of the stars for the DASH project, the glass negatives are wiped clean of all the women's notations, the loss of these historic and intimate drawings felt unimaginable. Their marks are depictions of the very moments of their imagination their innovation, and their exacting inquiry into the study of the stars. These glass plates are imbued with both tangible and intangible significance. The rich historic data of the stars captured on the photographic emulsion 
and the collection's continued import in contemporary astronomical research are inseparable from the historical linked ephemera illustrating human exploration and knowledge seeking and our longing to learn the stars and the people who carried that vision to us. At the time I learned of this in June 2019, approximately 4,425,000 4, plates had already been scanned and all written markings had been removed. Despite the fact that every plate with notations has photographically was photographically documented before being wiped. And even though a small group of around 600 marked plates depicting significant research and discoveries of the Harvard computers were set aside and preserved intact for posterity, it remains difficult to comprehend that the lion's share of the women's actual physical hand inked marks have been erased forever. I was immediately compelled to respond and turned my effort toward preserving some of their notations through art in the hopes I could poetically return their lost marks to the stars once again. Tracing Luminaries is a portfolio of six intaglio prints, each depicting notations derived from a unique glass plate negative that was marked by the Harvard computers. Working with the digital documentation imagery produced by Dash to photographically preserve the notations prior to erasing them, Island Press and I digitally removed the stars from the photographic image so that only the women's notations remained. The notations were then laser engraved into cast acrylic plates that were sub subsequently inked with transparent base and printed onto a direct starlight exposed cyanotype sheen collet, which is bonded to Hanamule copper plate backing paper. The process leaves the women's marks embossed and once the transparent base is partially dry, each raised mark is hand gilded with 24 karat gold. In my lifetime, science has confirmed the remarkable epiphany that we are made of star stuff, a topic that is deeply embedded in all of my work over the last 10 years. Most often attributed to Carl Sagan, the concepts and indeed the words themselves were pro-offered much earlier by a handful of scientists dating back to the early 20th century, including HCO director Harlow Shapley, who in 1929 in a New York Times interview is quoted as saying, we are made of the same stuff as the stars. So when we study astronomy, we are in a way only investigating our remote ancestry to our place in the universe of star stuff. Our very bodies consist of the same chemical elements found in the most distant nebulae, and our activities are guided by the same universal rules. This has key relevance as I consider the materiality of the photographic glass plate collection and its many handwritten notations. In the deep investigative work of the Harvard computers, they were gazing into a veritable cosmic looking glass. In notating the plates, they were inscribing a kind of origin story, the chronicle, the chronicle of the incredible link up of the stellar cosmochemistry and processes, which coalesced to a moment in time where a human being had the knowledge and tools to reflect on the formation of those stars. These inky stellar drawings are the literal and poetic realization of the human hand touching the stars. My effort to return the women's hand to, women's hand drawn notations to the stars began with the realization that I could not simply put them back together with the photograph of the stars from which they originated. This of course could be done digitally as Dash maintains the digital documentation of both. Yet the estrangement and dissociation of the women's marks from their stars is now permanent. And this fact needed a prominent place within the artwork. And so I turned instead to the symbolic and literal meaning of star made materials, photographic cyanotypes that have been exposed only to direct sunlight and pure 24 karat gold. The language of these materials holds, holds layers of meaning. There is an elegant symmetry in thinking about using the photographic medium to capture the light of stars that are invisible to the unaided eye. For in the process of photography itself, there is an invisibility to the image until it is developed and fixed. 
This latency is something that comes to mind again and again when considering the women's marks being wiped from the plates. We know that the marks were there from the documentary photographs taken of them, but the marks themselves exist now only as the latent pressure of a human hand upon the photographic glass plate surface. You can no longer see this evidence, the evidence of this embodied gravity, but it is there somewhere inside the glass. In reflecting further upon such symmetries, it is also remarkable to consider that the composition of the photographic emulsion itself is made of elements born of stellar processes. And, and the sole source of image illumination at the inception of the photographic medium in, in 1839 was our sun. So you could say that the stars have been collaborating with the photographic medium since its inception. The photographic glass plate negatives in Harvard's sky century recorded the light of myriad star types. One could rightly muse that when the photographic emulsion, which contains elements that, were that are born of dying stars, is then sensitized with the light of other stars during photographic exposure, the resulting image is in every real sense, the stars meeting across time. The photographic process used in this print edition is the cyanotype. Like any photographic print, this starlight recording holds within it the material meaning of the medium's moniker, phos and graphe, to draw with light. In reflecting on the invention of the cyanotype process and the word photography itself, it is interesting to note that both are credited to astronomer John Herschel. Herschel invented the cyanotype as a way to copy his, sci his scientific notes from his astronomical research. And so this photographic process became for me a symbolically relevant medium to render the scientific notes of the Harvard computers. The cyanotype in this edition are made on Okawara paper, where the paper's surface is chemically sensitized with an emulsion and is then exposed entirely to natural sunlight. There is no intervening negative, only the pure light directly exposing the cyanotype coated paper. Once developed, the image, which emerges as a surface of deep twilight blues, is simply a recording of our star's light on a diaphanous fiber substrate. The hand-drawn marks are the literal evidence of the women's passion for and devotion, devotion to their research, <clears throat> excuse me, their research, as much as they are the evidence of the stars themselves. In Imagining the women's lifelong mark making as the poetic gestures of exploration, we might also imagine that the women were among the first humans to touch the stars, tracing by hand as they were starlight across the cosmos. As gold is formed in the collision of neutron stars, it emerged as the perfect material with which to render and return their marks to the stars by retracing their marks again by hand with star matter. This is an important, this is a, this is a moment within the making of these prints that has profound in conceptual import. For in the process of laying down the gold, the gilder must use a finger to gently press the gold leaf down along the form and flow of the woman's own handwriting. With just this thin gold sheet between the hand of the gilder and the marks of the women, a meeting occurs across time and among stars. The entanglement of these star-made materials alongside interwoven ideas of latency and presence, of human and cosmic timescales, and of elemental reciprocity has coalesced as a kind of alchemy throughout the making of this work. In this way, their marks, these interstellar drawings, once again become embodied fluid topographies, embedded by the gravity force of the press as it orbited the intaglio plate and paper, finally revealing the women's marks as elevated. Then the elemental form of pure gold coalesces with the embossed ink layer forming a material bond that renders the text as star matter and raised 
as it would be above the print's own horizon line, their marks become, once again, starbound. So I thought I would end by sharing um, that the Tracing Luminaries print edition is featured in the August issue of National Geographic, which is still dazzling my mind. Um, the article is available in both the print and digital versions of the magazine. So um, you, can, you can find it online or in their app, um, or you can uh, order, order copies from their website. Um, anyway, I, a huge thank you to science journalist uh, Liz Cruzy, who had been following my work for a few years and wrote a beautiful piece that shares the story of the print edition and the women uh, computers. And, um, and my thanks as well to artist and visual researcher Jake Eshelman, who photographed the making of the edition at Island Press for National Geographic um, and whose beautiful documentary photos you just saw during my presentation. So, um, and, I'm, and finally, I'm, I'm thrilled to announce that Island Press will be releasing the print edition on September 16th and is holding a publication event at the press that day from four to six. So if you happen to be in St. Louis, please join us. And um, you can find additional information about that on both of our websites. Um, so thank you again so much for joining me today. And I would love to answer any questions um, if you have any. Give a round of applause to Erica for the wonderful talk. Thank you. And if you have a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask. So j just a practical question. How many um, volumes are being printed? Yes, um, it's a very, very small edition. So um, it, the the work is is the six plates in a in a portfolio. So um, and it's an edition of eight. Is it just a follow up. So is is this something you think that uh, art galleries are going to buy or, or university libraries? Like who are the? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> what is the cost? <laughs> I um, I can't reveal the cost yet. Um, that is being released by Island Press um, at, at you know after the event or or at the time of the event, um, and they'll be handling um, the edition. Um, but um, but yes, I mean my hope my hope is that the the editions could be placed in in collecting museums and collecting libraries that you know my hope is that with 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 so few of of these these wonderful prints i i would love to at least have a few of these editions in public collections so that that the public could have an opportunity to have more access to them is is i guess what i would say enjoyed um the connections you made with uh, gold to uh, stars exploding into each other and things like that. How did you, did you try a number of different artistic methods and then settled on these ones or were these methods you had used before? That's such a great question. Um, this was entirely new. Um, I mean, I certainly used gold before, but, um, and I had done cyanotypes like, gosh, back in, many moons ago, let's just leave it there. Um, and so, um, but I, um, but when we, when I approached the, when I approached the, the problem of how to poetically work with materials to, to return them to, to the stars in a material way, um, I initially started with um, platinum and palladium actually, um, a little bit further up the uh, element. <laughs> chart there. Um, and so we did a, a series of, of tests with 
with both platinum and palladium. And um, and ultimately it it was it just wasn't working somehow. It it wasn't, I mean, I I I'd sort of already brought in the element of gold, um, but I wasn't, I it just wasn't working. There was it wasn't, it was missing something. And it wasn't until I was um sort of happenstance re researching the word photography and was reminded that that was, you know, Herschel's invention and that Herschel, you know, also invented the cyanotype and the specific reason he invented the cyanotype really captured my attention because, you know, the women would have been, you know, late contemporary I mean, or, you know, late contemporaries to him. Like he, he, they may have overlapped some or, you know, they would have come directly after his, his legacy. And so there, there just felt like there was a, a really beautiful link there. Um, and also an understanding of that process being um, able to reproduce, um, you know, literally uh, astronomical notes. So, and, and plus it's um, such a captivating blue. Yeah, it's, it's the, the color is, is really amazing, especially since the, the plates we're working with are all, you know, just black and white, basically, that to see that color is, is really incredible. Well, actually, this is another this is another facet, actually, because you're reminding me that um, early on, like when this sort of was all convergence, but like early on, I had been working with, you know, had a, had a group of the plates um, in a folder that I was working with, you know, plates that I had downloaded from from Dash. And I was looking at, you know, the various markings and I opened a few of them in. Um, in in Photoshop and just you know oh what do they look like as the positive like you see them as the negative obviously but so I did an inversion and what's so fascinating to me is that the plates which are black and white they are black and white photographs um, because some of them had yellowed so much that the inversion actually inverted them to blue not black so the they toned this this gorgeous um you know blue black color and and that really captured my imagination that there was there was a link to this blue additionally in if you were to call you know print in um contemporary terms uh print those those plates today I guess um, this may be kind of a repetitive thing, but could you mention the process that you used or the title of the process that you used to color the paper again? It's there, it's a cyanotype. So it's, yeah, so it's a photograph of, it's basically, um, it's a chemical process that is uh, photographically, set, you know, sensitive to light and the chemicals are adhered to the paper. Or you know, lay down on the paper, and then through process of, of developing and exposing and developing and recoding, there's sort of a, a step by step process that that we found created those really dark blues um, in various tones. Um, but but essentially, it's about um, forty minutes. Each each um, cyanotype is about a um, 40 minutes of sun. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. Were, were some of the tasks, so you, you mentioned, put, I can't remember the term now, but putting on the gold leaf, that's something that's a specialized task. So they, was there someone at the press that's like, they're really that's what they do really well or was this was it all students learning these processes you talk a little bit about that yeah we all learned we all learned how to do it together and in, in fact so when i went back to the press uh, or when i went to the press for the first time rather um you know i had been watching them on over zoom you know doing these processes and they had they had figured out you know how to do it and then when i got there i had to learn and 
And that was a remarkable process because actually we, you know, everybody contributed some knowledge to how to actually get the right, um, the right amount of gold and also the timing of the tackiness of the ink, the, tra the transparent ink that we use, um, you know, it needs to be slightly dry, but not so dry. Um, Cause then it, it, it did different things with, with the golds. Also different golds worked differently. So we tested several different types of gold. Um, but in the end, it's really just, you know, the gilder and the print and their marks. And there's this real intimacy that that's developed. And I loved that as part of the conversation between each person who was involved in the project and sort of, you know, not only are there marks touching the stars, but each of our hands touched their marks. And so there's this really beautiful sort of invisible conversation, if you will, that's um, inherent in the materials. Such good questions, thank you. <laughs> so th th this is not a question, but a, but a comment on a comment that you made earlier, and I hadn't thought about it, about the Herschel's and the, the, the continuity in the in the project. And I did just did a, a quick look up and yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Fleming was born uh, nine years after Caroline right. died. Wow. And I would guess that Caroline must have also used the cyanotype herself, right? I would think. Yeah. I mean, there that 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 legacy that that ancestry is right there. It's I mean they just it would have been like they would have been the next generation to be working with his ideas. Um, I I love that. So, <laughs> and maybe this is not a topic that people want to discuss, but I mean, I, I guess there are a, a number of sensitivities around this scrubbing of the plates. And I mean, I, I hear reverberations of it. I'm not part of the yeah. of the conversation. The, 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 can you comment more on that? Yeah, I would be happy to. And and I'll just say that that the sensitivity of the conversation is is. Um, very well understood by by everybody that I worked with um, at Harvard, and I think you know even in my early conversations with Josh Grinley, who is the the director of of uh, the Dash project. I mean, there's really an, an understanding of of what is being lost and also how to preserve it. I mean, there were obviously conversations early on in in the creation of these of this project between the cultural heritage side of things and the science side of things and my understanding is is that early on there was there was sort of a big kerfluffle around like how do we solve the the differences in cultural and scientific need and and interest and focus and i think it's a really important conversation that we have publicly and that we have in our you know that we think about because you know, there's, it, it can help us differentiate between what is human and what is data, right? And so, and I think that we, you know, in the sciences, I mean, I work collaboratively across the sciences, you know, to great extent. And I, and I, and I can see that this is a, you know, an ongoing kind of conversation that I think is, gets updated every, every time we have it. And, and I think, you know, the, what what the arts can do and what the cultural heritage side of things can do is to help us to remember the humanity in the data and and that there is this this balance that we that we can strike and i i would say that everybody that i've i've worked with um you know across the whole the whole 3 years that i've been working on this project everybody has been understanding even if it's uncomfortable you know and it's okay that it's uncomfortable these conversations uncomfortable conversations are okay but we can we can address them and we can find um meaningful ways to to um to think differently about how we work with 
with with the human elements and and the data. Um, so I guess that's how I, I would answer that. And I'd love to hear anybody else's perspective on that too. Again, I was just thinking about sort of um, the physicality of things and just sort of like, you know, like you said, it's like we took photographs, but photographs really aren't the same things as pre preserving the markings in a physical way. Um, but then I was, I was also thinking there's this, um, there was a director here at the Harvard College Observatory named Menzel who was not into sort of the whole glass plate project and started throwing glass plates out. And so now we know of this thing called the Menzel Gap, where, okay, we know a bunch of plates were actually destroyed while he was the director. Wow. So, it's, so it's interesting to think of like, well, the, you know, in our era where we've destroyed the physical markings, but in a past era, they actually even just destroyed the entire plates themselves because they thought they weren't important anymore. Wow, that's interesting. I came across him in my research because actually it turns out one of the original um plates that i had selected um because it had interesting markings and this is interesting um we determined was most likely marked by him later like in the whatever whenever he was there was it the 30s or something i can't remember um 40s i don't remember anyway um and and i pulled it because i i i knew that like later I had learned that that occasionally later the the markings were made by other researchers and and occasionally um, those were men researchers, which is fine. Um, but I really wanted to focus on on the women and and so I removed that plate. But it's interesting um, it's interesting to hear that hear that piece of info that he was he was trying. I mean, you know, I I've heard again and again. Um, also that, you know, in the time, the women would erase their own marks and remark the plate, which I think is an interesting thing to bring into the conversation. Although it doesn't, it doesn't um, justify, in, in one sense, it doesn't justify the erasing of the historic markings because at a certain point they do become historic. But at the same time, like their process was, was you know, involved with, um, making and remaking their own research. Like they they would become more aware of something or they would see an error and they would go back and 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 correct it. Or maybe they were looking for something different. In fact, one of the plates I worked with, uh, the plate uh, that has Jupiter in it um, was a fascinating plate because when we when we worked with the scan, you know, we were doing sort of um, the complementary thing to what Dash does. So Dash removes the marks from the stars. So what I was doing was removing the stars from the marks. So, so we would move the marks, uh, remove the stars rather, and then left with these, these amazing marks. But the scan was so good that we got in there and um, there, were, there were ghost marks from the previous marking of the plate. And so, we had it up on a massive screen and we're going over it and and i had made i had made very stringent rules like like if it was an intentional error like if it was a a blob of ink that dropped on the plate but it had been left there and it was very clearly or like something had been scratched out if it was intentional we left it um and so when i got to this plate i had to make a decision about whether or not to include the ghosted part of the marking as well. And when we left it, it, it was very intrusive to the rest of, of the, the marks. And I eventually decided that, that it was, they had not intended for, that, for those ghost marks to remain. Like they had wiped the plate and remarked it. And that I, I wanted to be, um, sort of loyal to their their mark and and their intent, and so we eventually removed the ghost the ghost mark from the previous um, the previous writing. So yeah, there was a lot that went on behind the scenes that <laughs> even in you know 
if I if I included everything, it could be probably another 40 minute talk. <laughs> um, can you speak a little bit to the process of preparing the glass plates for print? Um, was there any sort of like challenges with uh, find like did you model it after the plates that exist in the in the collection or did you have to adjust like thickness um, and then I have a, a, if, how you etched or um, got the relief into the plates as well. yeah yeah that's that's a great question so so I didn't handle the glass plates themselves um, at all so the glass plates were you know once they're wiped and scanned they're put back into what's called the plate stacks and, and those are now preserved. Like the idea is to actually stop handling the plates because the plates are very fragile. They're, some of them are over hundred years old. And, um, and so the idea is to actually, you know, handle them less and, and work with these digital um, scans more. So the digital scans that are used for astronomy are crazy high resolution. Like I wouldn't even know what to do with them if you gave me one and, and Nico can, <laughs> can confirm that um, because they're they're designed to be viewed in a very specific um, astronomical software, but um, but the digital images that they took to photo document the marks on the plate before they remove them are your basic you know JPEG. So they're high resolution. I mean they're they're high quality. But they're but they're a, a digital um, format. So I worked with those. So essentially, then what I would do is I would re I I used the, that image because it was so exact. I I could basically remake the plate to the exact scale, um, one to one scale of of the original plate. Um, and we did that with acrylic, with cast acrylic. So so the marks. So we removed the stars and then you know formatted the size of the plate and then we printed it to a laser etching machine so so it was actually a laser etched into what is an acrylic uh, plate so when you saw the photo of me holding that up to the light that's what I was holding I was actually holding um, an, an already inked acrylic plate that was about to get um, printed and we were inspecting it Okay, so you, you printed off of acrylic, not off of glass. Correct, correct. Oh, thank yeah. you. Because it has to go through the press. So, and that the press is, has enormous weight in order to, to really um, lay down the image, you know, into the paper and emboss the paper and, um, and yeah, so. Beautiful, thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you for the question. How did you, how exactly when you talk about um, removing the stars, like uh, how exactly did you do that specific part of the process? <laughs> well, um, one of the students who we worked with, Avery, um, was a master in Photoshop and we basically, um, we digitally removed them. Yeah, so that was, that was, it went through a digital process <clears throat> where we started with the original digital file um, <clears throat> that I downloaded directly from the Dash uh, database, and then um, and then and then we we worked the file so that we could select all of the marks and remove everything else. Thank you. So so early you 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 mentioned that the. Um... You know the the computer astronomers themselves had you know erased some markings because they wanted to remark something uh, slightly differently. Um, but then in a, in another context, um, the the ghostly markings of plates that where the markings had ostensibly uh, been erased. Um, uh, and actually, I, I, I've seen that in a couple of places. Uh, and I was just wondering how how often one sees the the ghostly traces of the of the erased markings. That's such a good question. I mean, 
you know, I could, I could spend years going through the plates. I mean, like I, you know, if I could, you know, make another like hundred prints, I would. Um, I mean, I just, I love the process because it, it was so wonderful to get really, you know, to get so close into the universe, if you will, of their marks where, you know, they became, you know, because sometimes they're dots and lines and they, they become their own star fields in a way. Um, and I think that um, it would be really interesting to actually do a study of, of the ghost, the ghostly marks. I'm, I mean, I'm certain I saw it on more than one plate, um, but yeah, I'd have to go back and I'd have to go back and, and look again. So have you come across that? Leo, in your in your work, yeah. Well, Nico kindly uh, sent me a, a couple of Fitz images of um, of R. W. Monocerosus, and um, depending on setting the contrast in the in the software, mm -hmm. um, occasionally I could see the ghostly markings emerge in mm -hmm. different places. So it was kind of kind of interesting. Oh, so you're talking about the post dash scan yes yes having ghostly mark oh that's interesting yeah okay. well I, I think that that's the case I mean Nico can confirm that I don't yeah. know I mean, if it's in the fits file then yeah then you're exactly yes. right it's that's a ghost ghost image from from the wiping mm -hmm. so 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 maybe the wiping wasn't always completely successful well I have to say I mean so before I started on the venture of the of the print edition I was actually trying to work with the actual marks on the plates themselves. And so there was a first version of this whole story where I was working with Josh Grindley and, and um, Lindsay, the, the former curator, to, they had put aside 50 plates for me and I was going to actually transfer the marks onto another substrate, like the actual women's marks onto another substrate um, to have the actual marks live on. And so that was, and so I had gone to, um, I had been meeting with uh, folks in Harvard conservation uh, departments and with the stacks um, to try to find a way because of my background as a, in conservation science was looking at materials that could safely lift and you know release and lift the marks from the plate and and adhere them to another substrate and so we were in the process of doing that they had put for I had, I had gone in January of 2020 to do the first test and it was successful because we could we were able to migrate the ink to another substrate using a very particular solvent and so I was able to show like proof of concept that we could do it um, and so I put a proposal together and um, I was going to come back in the middle of March in 2020 and complete, you know, actually do the transfer of these 50 plates. Um, and, and then the pandemic hit exactly when I would have been arranging to, to get to Harvard and of course everything shut down. So the, the project uh, was canceled and um, and those plates were then funneled back into the lineup for dash wiping and scanning. Um, although I feel proud that a few of those plates actually were, were saved for uh, the Wilhelmina Fleming um, collection. So I feel like I had maybe a tiny little part in, in a few additional plates um, uh, being preserved for, for, for the future. So anyway, that was a long way to answer your question. And I can just add the the Fleming collection is right now in the process of uh, evaluation from uh, Harvard's preservation services, and they're they're making sure that all those plates are um, stabilized, and then they're going to do they're going to rephotograph all of those plates for us. So it's it's uh, that'll be nice to have a, a digital surrogate of all of those too. But then, if anyone ever wants to visit, we will also be able to show them that here at the observatory. Uh -huh. I can't wait. Well, some someday soon, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you up. <laughs> All right. Are there, are there any other questions? 
Well, I want to I want to thank Erica again for coming to our office hours, and thank you all for for attending as well. Thank you so much, everyone.